Hello, everyone. There are three words that I would like us to consider um, while I'm doing a performance. And those words are presence, witness, and communitas. For me, communi communitas is something that we don't get to experience very often. And 
our West, Western realized experience. For me, communitas is a kind of initiation. It is experienced by a group of people that helps to uh, strengthen social bonds around specific ideas or ideals in the culture. And also it is non-trauma based. It points us towards the liminal threshold of things that we can only dream about. So um, to kind of bring us all into the same space, I'd like us to breathe together, basically. And the way that I like to breathe is by bringing air all the way to my body in as deeply as I can feel it. So for me right now, that's like the belly, that's like, you know, the, you know, this area, bringing in breath, feeding all of my systems with life-giving prana. So if you can just do that while I'm representing presence with your eyes open. I'm just gonna take us somewhere and I invite everyone who's watching to come along. I invite all of our ancestral lineages, lineages to come into the space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Just to share a few details about sometimes it takes a minute to come back into the body. All right. So some of the methodologies that I use to fuel my work include performance as research. And um, for me, that's about the continuous study of the effects of ritual on communities, things that happen when people gather together intentionally. The principle of Sankofa, um, as practiced by subjects of the African diaspora, which is beautiful because it supports the practice, supports the practice of like reaching back for things that are, have been dismissed, histories that have been dismissed, the unknown. It allows you to create your own story because so many of the details for so many of us have lost forever. So we bring that into our current moment to uh, 
help us create a living identity that also incorporates our ancestral knowledge, however deep it may be. Um, film and video documentation, through interviews with other artists and community members is also a methodology that I use. And as you just witnessed, the embodied practice of movement and sound and writing. And this kind of a building of various syncretic tools to create um, performance or ritual experience is something that is uh, part of my DNA. Actually, it's come to me throughout my ancestral past into the future. And it's also been um, informed by other teachers like Maladoma Somme and Kali Mai, who was a personal teacher of mine. We took long walks in the desert together and they would talk and I would listen in a very kind of old school teacher, student or um, master, disciple kind of way. Um, and I'm really interested in how the sacred or ideas of the sacred, the word is overused clearly, but there are things about us, there are mysteries within us, as well as out there, things that we don't see that we need to give a name to. We give a name to the ways that we interact with the invisible realms and we call that the sacred interaction or experience or desire. Um, so, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show another film, but really I'd like you, you to think about some questions to ask me. I'm um, more uh, movement and sound and embodied in my practice. So any questions that you have are welcome and it's easier for me to sort of, it's easier for me to address um, what's in the room and to sort of pretend like I know what everybody's thinking. So um, we're gonna show this last film and then we'll open up for questions. And I'll say this last film is called um, Emotional Body. And it's my personal experience uh, with witnessing uh, someone uh, reaching back, reaching to kind of like the recesses of their own memory to create a story. So there we go. Thank you. Mysterious. Elewa, elewa, so kere kere meje, elewa, elewa, ala roye kila uche. Mysterious. Mysterious is walking in the woods and being alone, but feeling like there's 25,000 other people walking behind you. And your breathing gets heavy and your feet get light. And you feel like all of a sudden, everything around you is breathing with you. And you can see the faces of all the women who have held their breath, waiting for you. Elegua, elegua, aso kere kere meje. Elegua, elegua, ala ruide ki la poche. Misterio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've known of this word since I was a child. There was always someone visiting me when I was a kid. And when I was little, I didn't have any other form of accessing that. So I used to pray the rosary every night, every single night. Every single night, I could not go to bed without praying the rosary. It, it was 
something that was in me. I didn't know why, but it was a thing to do. Everybody said, oh, that's a misterio. That's a mystery that you have, or what they call a don't. And it wasn't so much the, the flicking of the beads as much as the feeling. And when every night I was done, I felt safe. No matter what happened before, no matter what I came from that day, but I remember being as young as seven, flicking that rosary, knowing how to say it. Years later, I stopped, found a new way. But when I picked up the rosary, I understood. My grandmother used to pray through the rosary. So that was her way of taking care of me in times of serious distress. So when I started doing the rosary, I could feel her standing next to me the same way I did as a child. And I've never shared that. But she has always been my greatest mystery. Thank you. Modo pues. <laughs> Gracias. <laughs> Sorry, it's a satisfaction. Oh, it's a thing. It's a feeling of like well, the cursor. Story about satisfaction that I have never told anybody. Yes. 
satisfaction the first time I was in Japan and to manage to actually have friends for the first time and be in a place where people didn't know me and assumed I was normal. There was satisfaction in there. So my word, yeah, okay, wait. So my word is clarity. Clarity is uh, something I've rarely experienced, if at all. Um, It's kind of, um, it was like a state of being where the road is just clear. It's like looking, it's like looking through, down through the water of the stream and seeing the articulated rocks and knowing if you don't know what's under them, you know you have specific choices to make. There's no cloudy water. There's nowhere, you know where to step, or you know where to select, or you know your choices, or it's somewhere where you want to go. Um, story. Hmm. I don't know if this is one I've never told anyone. But I remember when that movie Remains of the Day came out a long time ago. I was living in Louisiana. And there's a scene in that movie, I don't know if you know the movie, but Anthony Hopkins plays a butler in this grand house in England. And um, his father before him played the butler. And among other things, he ends up having to fire his father because he gets too old and he takes over as butler. But anyway, so he's in this house and World War II happens, and a new person takes over the house, and it's actually an American, played by Christopher Reeve. But it's interesting because there's a scene toward the end of the movie where Christopher Reeve is uh, going through the house with the butler, and they walk into this grand dining room or some grand room, and they hear a noise, and it's a pigeon that's been caught in the room. And so, they managed to get the pigeon and, you know, much to Anthony Hopkins surprise, the master of the house is helping him, you know, they get, you know, they get the pigeon. Of course, he's an American. He's not, you know, it's American, not a rich American that owns the house. And they get the pigeon and um, they open a window and Christopher Reeve has a pigeon. He lets the pigeon go and they close it. And then it's a reverse angle and you see Anthony Hopkins staring as the pigeon flies away as the camera moves bar back and back but then he's in the house and the pigeon's gone and I knew at that moment when I had to leave Louisiana that otherwise I would be like Anthony Hopkins stuck forever in that house and that was the moment and that was the moment really when I said art can do this to people so there's my moment of clarity so cool Oh yeah, I see this question from Iris, um, who's asking, who's saying, I would be curious to hear Jaguar Mary X speak more about glossolalia, how you came to this practice, your references, etc. Um, I can offer a story. Yeah, I can offer a story about um, how the practice of um, kind of dismantling language came to me. I started at a very young age. Um, when I was 11, my mother converted to Buddhism. And that meant that my brother and I were um, in, uh, I guess, like a temple um, chanting words that we didn't know. We had no context for the Sanskrit words that we spoke every day in the morning and in the evening. And we had the literature that, that you know, came along, the stories that came along with uh, the mantras that we were reciting. 
But in my mind at the time, um, there, there, what happened was a kind of rupture between, um, you know, actually not a rupture, but just like an opening really of things, the, the difference between making sense and not making sense became erased. There was no difference. There was only what one uttered. And depending on one, what one uttered, certain things would happen. So if I said, mom, you know, I want a cookie, then I would receive a cookie. If I said, you know, maybe something else would happen. So it's part of a experiment, an ongoing experiment, because what I think is happening um, through my kind of ongoing research, you know, if you wanna, if you wanna get some references, Sean Crawley's book, uh, Pentecostal Breath is really great. It was a kind of a, um, important um, text when I was writing about, you know, writing my own thesis, doing my own thesis work. Also another one, um, Jackie M. Alexander, Pedagogies of um, Crossing is really great. There's a chapter in there specifically about the sacred. Um, and also I had come out of this um, Austin class about breaking down language, like what words mean and how they work and all that stuff. So, um, so that's some of the ways that it came in, but also I'm finding, I'm, I'm still kind of trying to put, um, trying to put meaning on, not the words themselves, but the effects. So like how it makes me feel. I mean, I can say that my nervous system is calmed when I do glossolalic practice, and perhaps glossolalia is kind of a misnomer because glossolalia specifically comes out of a Pentecostal tradition where people are, you know, they consider themselves kind of like taken up by the spirit and so, you know, language is coming up out. And I could also say that I'm taking, I'm taken up by a kind of energy that I allow in, and then I kind of express it um, through these symbols um, and sounds. Um, but I'm really also interested in like how, um, what's happening in my mind around language is becoming unraveled. And for, for me, that's actually part of a freedom practice um, to remove myself from kind of like this regimented, um, like this regimented language forms, which I've learned over like decades, right? And to kind of sort of um, dissolve them a bit and just kind of see what else comes out of it. And the meaning isn't like, I'm actually saying that's a chair. I'm not saying that at all. I'm actually exploring some kind of interiority. Um, that has no, that I cannot articulate really in English. Um, was that, I don't know if that, <laughs> are there any other questions? Um, I have a question. Yes. And hopefully you can hear me on the phone. Okay. Yeah. Gary oh. has a question. Oh boy, no. I can just come up here. Oh yeah, come yeah, up, come up. Here. <laughs> you can just sure, you're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, you want to sit? You can sit. I'll just sit here in this little chair. Um, oh, oh, no. Can you stand up here? Stand yes. up here with me. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right, come on. So, come closer. All right. Okay. <laughs> now that I'm here. Thank you so much for that beautiful practice. Mm -hmm. um, and my question was just about the sort of community and communication you have with plants and, you know, mugwort. Is that the one that you said you were? Yeah, in? yeah. Has such beautiful healing properties, but also it's more than just um, the usefulness of them to us. And mm -hmm. just if you could speak more about sort of your communication and relationship with them. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, hmm. Yeah, we have a way that we understand what it means to listen. And usually the listening is through sound. And sometimes the listening is actually um, the listening is actually a felt sense than a sort of auditory experience. And so, and also it's a felt sense, and also it's like um, instances that occur that bring you into what you begin to understand as a kind of relationship. And it happens over time. So for example, with mugwort, you know, you talk about the usefulness and it was very useful to me because I was in a healing crisis and I um, had a doctor tell me that I should have my large intestine removed. And so that, lar that same day, 
um, a friend said, have you tried acupuncture? And so I was a student at the, at the time. It was very hard for me to be able to afford. Like, But they took me in. It was a, it was a crisis situation. And I was getting acupuncture and moxa three times a week. So the moxa, if folks know about mugwort, um, moxa is actually like this kind of fluffy plant material that is mugwort. Uh, so that was my first encounter with mugwort. And then when I moved up here to the Hudson Valley in 2019, I moved in winter. I moved into the Art Life Institute. And, um, you know, by, by May, there was like this hedge of plants, like in front of my house. It was like remarkable. I was like, where did those plants come from? And it turned out they were mugwort. I was about to cut them down and Hope came over and he said, oh, you're cutting down all that mugwort. And I was like, no, I don't think so. So I, I started sort of listening and playing and, and the communication comes from a, um, you know, first starts with a kind of honoring, you know, it's like a, it's like a kind of like a surrender to um, like, well, a few things. One is that, you know, you know that people have used mugwort throughout all time for different things. You know, Roman soldiers used mugwort in their shoes for energy. I don't know, this is, so they say. But, um, but I get a sense that Harriet Tubman may have used mugwort because it's so prolific, you know, growing up, you know, Hudson Valley. And um, so the communication is like from, from what is known and then what is becoming known. Um, it is, you know, I, and I have, I know folks who say the plant talked to me and, you know, blah, 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 this happened. And I, that's not my experience. My experience is that I'm relating to the plant. I'm open to this relationship. I'm um, seeing things happen around me that reveal uh, some kind of communication. That's another way that I um, understand communication is like, instances of things that are happening that point to this other thing, um, which has to do with like this kind of fractaling and gathering of knowledge happening simultaneously. It's a kind of technology that I don't even know the name of, you know, but it's like, actually I'd be curious to hear about, you know, John's experiences with plants. Um, hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. questions there. Thank yeah. you so much for your performance. Oh, the fence is moving. Is asking a question. I'm sorry. She can unmute too and just ask it out loud. Yeah, Maria. Maria is an um, artist who's a painter, sculptor, and movement artist. Sorry about that. Here we go. This is a really good question. Nuria, if you want to just talk um, directly, if you if you want to, we can also just read your question. Um, but you're free to just um, unmute yourself and talk to Jaguar Mary. Um, Hi. 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 So, I mean, uh, it's wonderful to see your performance. It's good? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and to uh, hear you speak. Um, uh, it, it feels like a great opportunity to ask questions. The first, or I'm mostly curious about uh, what kinds of effects you've seen um, doing rituals in communities, um, kind of the, the aftermath of the research you were talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I, just, I just came out of a four day um, ritual experience that was actually a performance at the Chocolate Factory in New York called Vessel, created by David Thompson. I was one of the journeyers, as well as three other, four other um, movers and it, it's um, an unchoreographed piece that is about you know presence and witnessing. It's about that. So I'm coming freshly out of that. And so what I can say after those performances um, is that uh, people, 
I mean, it's hard to sort of quantify these things because we are talking about um, undecipherable um, effects. So we're so all we have really is what people say right now. You know, what we that's one of the things we have. So when I do a performance or a ritual performance, the words that mo I most often hear is that. Um, there is some sort of interior shift that takes place. And because we're all different, it's hard to really say what, you know, how do you approach another person's interiority? You can't. Um, that person might be able to write about it later or be able to reflect or dream upon it later. Um, but, you know, in terms of these ideas about community toss, which is really the focus for me is that even though everyone is different and everyone's interior sort of, um, expression and uh, reality is different. There are ways that when we come together and have a ritual experience together, that there is uh, some kind of um, transmission that is collectively felt and um, comes alive, you know? And so, <clears throat> I love the fact that I'm in a, you know, a science art school because these are some of the questions that, these are very old questions. And um, I feel like what could potentially happen is that the, the felt sense of like being in ritual and, and using movement to uh, create a feeling in the body, um, at some point is going to be like very clear. It's gonna become very clear what that technology is. Um, I think because there are so many ways that that expressions of the sacred are shut down or there's a fear of it from trauma, from like religious dogma or whatever's happened. There is also like the um, dismissal of, um, of or a specific placement of what is sacred. It's sacred is over here, science is over here, our lives are right here, but actually it's all happening at once. So um, when I think about what actually happens, um, what actually happens is that um, there's some new data working. Um, there's potentially some kind of um, like neurological, um, there's a memory that's triggered, you know? Uh, and that memory is what has effects, I think, more than like, or as much as what I do to actually make that memory come up, you know? I think the memory is like, and the memory is old, you know? It's like, it's like, mem it's ancestral knowledge, ancestral memory and knowing. And, um, We've needed that to survive. We need it now to survive. So um, that's my attempt at answering your question. Um, we have a question from Kathy. Kathy, I can read your question. Or, uh, I'm going to have you put your, let me have you move your <laughs> pin. There. Okay, here's Kathy. Hi. Hey, Kathy. Hello. I, I'm happy to. Thank you. Hello, hello, lovely one. So nice to see you. I, 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 I this follows on the last question, which was so great, which is just to get a little actually what movement does for um, bringing out a lot of that kind of expression, those kinds of accesses to memory, to to histories and ancestral histories, um, because I think that it's a really interesting uh, thing to work in tandem with the ways you're working with language. And I just love to hear you speak about that some more. Yeah, um, I am specifically here right now to use my body as a ritual tool for all of us to do what we need to do to live and to thrive on this planet right now. I'm six feet one. I have very long arms and very long legs. I, my structure represents um, a channel. And so for me, that's how I think about it. 
So for me, like when I use move, I have these long fingers, you know, um, I have a body for ritual and I have a body to create shapes that again, trigger or bring up certain ancestral memories. And this is like, it's a great question. I haven't, no one's asked me this before and I've been thinking about this and I realize that my physicality is part of it. Um, and I don't want to shy away from that. Also, um, gesture as language transmits. And so I use a lot of gesture and I think that gesture um, which is a form of movement, but it isn't like da, 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 da. you know, it's it's an it's a intended sort of focusing with the body. Um, it's a use of time and energy. It's actually what I'm actually doing is moving my energy with my hands, moving the outer layers of my energy with my hands, and they cannot be seen; they can only be felt. So. Um, I'm wondering what else I can say about that. Um, oh, how does movement heal? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the dancers, the ritual dancers, the movers, the drum, it's all ancestral stuff. This, these, these are, these are modes that we've always used to like heal our bodies, just like simply shaking. There's a shaman in Indonesia who invites people to pay thousands of dollars to like just shake all week, you know? Um, but, you know, people come out of that feeling like something's been shaken off, you know? It's like you do that shaking for a week and you're actually shedding something in that may be lodged in the body that you're just like continually like, I'm getting rid of this, I'm out of here. I'm, this is no longer part of me, I'm, this is gone. You know, this is like, you know, and we've seen our, you know, grandparents, great grandparents probably doing stuff like that. It's like, oh God, yes, oh, get, you know. It's like, this is very intentional and um, is a signal to the nervous system really, that you're willing to let go of something, you're willing to let some healing in. I mean, I, there's so much, uh, there's so much kind of uh, healing potential in all the things, in nature, in like loving someone, in eating good food, like so much healing potential all around. And so it was just like, ah, you know, done, done. Okay, let's bring in Let's bring in some like, some power. Where's my power? Let's bring in the power. I'm bringing in the power right now. I'm doing it. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Continue talking about it. I love that. I love that. You're so great. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm just looking here because that's where I can see your face, but I know you're yeah. here. Anyway, yeah. Oh, beautiful! Yay! Oh, beautiful! Yeah. All the way from India. Yeah. I've been. Great performances. Got so many good friends here. Thank you. All right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Maria. Yeah. Thank you, Maria, for your question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for showing yeah. up. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Let's see if I can do this. Nina, I just wanted to say a quick. Yes. Oh. Okay, we can keep going. Yes, yes. coming up to. I just wanted to say a quick. Um, in India, they touch the feet of the master. And I feel like touching your feet. Oh my gosh. Oh my and gosh. And I wanted to, yeah, right on my back. Right on my back. <laughs> I, um, I wanted to, um, I wanted to 
address, especially that video of uh, the video, the second video. Yeah. Uh, where you, where you uh, created the babies and you, <clears throat> in a hands off, a kind, kind way, uh, allowed these baby children to touch their own soul without pushing time. You worked with soul time and gentle time. You worked with love time. You worked with healing time, uh, giving time, and I'm I'm just blown away. I'm just I'm just in tears. I'm in healing. I'm I'm so thankful to be here. And I'll just keep keep on keep on creating more babies. Keep on keep on healing us. God help us. I think RPI, I think Nina, I think Brenda and Kathy and Marianne and my my mothers, my art mothers. Just, I'm, I'm just having meltdown of feeling. Thank you so much. I touch your feet. I touch your feet. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I guess that's it. Thank you all. That was really special. Uh, such a um, treat to have my uh, artists and friends here in this new school that I have found myself in. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us, Kathy and Brenda, and also um, the two people that were missing from our cohort, Hanaya and Tamara, and Arma Yari that are normally with us. I, I left them out because they're not here in the room. I uh, wanted to acknowledge their part in this series. Uh, and so that's it. Thank you.